Bienvenidos, estamos aquí con el doctor Bruce Wampol y el doctor Luis Botella, quienes eh, van a hacer una entrevista para presentar el libro del gran debate de la psicoterapia publicado por Eleftería el verano del 2021. Adelante, buenas tardes. Buenas tardes, Enrique. Buenas tardes, Luis. Y pues, Hello, Bruce. Comenta. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon, Bruce. I hope this finds you well in these troubled times that we're living. And nice to meet you again. It's I good to some... meet you. And thank you for the invitation. I look forward to talking with you. Perfect. I have some kind of introductory questions for the, the non-expert uh, reader or the newcomer to the field. And, and I, I, I know, I certainly know that you have been asked this many times that you've all even written about it and it might sound redundant to you, some of them. But I think that a newcomer, a reader to the great psychotherapy debate, for instance, with no prior knowledge of psychotherapy research, or even the skeptic that, that there are some um, might be asking uh, uh, this important and introductory question, such as, for instance, can we confidently assert that psychotherapy works? Well, yes, that's probably the easiest question because um, it's very clear that psychotherapy works. Um, clinical trials, naturalistic settings, it works as well as psychotropic medication for most disorders. It's longer lasting, uh, fewer side effects. So it's very clear that on the whole, psychotherapy works. And interestingly, it works just as well in clinical practice as it does in clinical trials. So the treatment that psychotherapists are given um, is, I say, remarkably effective. And given, given the fact that, that there are uh, still different approaches to psychotherapy, even different treatments as well, which may surprise also the newcomer from another field from than psychology, in fact, is there a therapy approach that works better than all the rest? Because they are apparently very different from each other. Well, this is where it starts to get complicated, isn't it? So psychotherapy is remarkably effective. If we think of medicine... You know, there's some treatments that clearly are indicated where others aren't. There's advances where one treatment, like for gastric ulcers, uh, is very much superior to what we used to do a few decades ago. In psychotherapy, it's much different um, for the most part, with very, very few exceptions. Um, all therapies that are given by competent therapists Uh, and have a legitimate psychological basis, produce outcomes that are approximately equal. So it really doesn't matter in terms of the benefits which psychotherapy is administered. So sometimes that's hard to believe because clearly some of the ingredients must be more potent than others. So that leads us, and we'll discuss this, I'm sure, today, but that leads us to, well... If it's not those specific ingredients like in medicine, what makes psychotherapy work? Interesting question. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's, are, are the effects of psychotherapy lasting and reliable? Because the, the idea of, of uh, some critics to psychotherapy is that they are the effect of a persuasion by, by the therapist and they will not last as will, for instance, the effects of of the drugs or, or, or psychological interventions? Well, first of all, um, psychotherapy is long lasting. So the effects um, seem to persist over time for, for most disorders. It's longer lasting than antidepressant medication, for instance. When antidepressant medication is withdrawn, patients relapse at a much greater rate than they do after psychotherapy. So whatever is learned by the patient in treatment seems to persist. But that doesn't mean that the persuasion of the therapist is unimportant. Mm -hmm. The therapist persuades uh, the patient to do uh, something that's really 
healthy and good for them. And that has a lasting effect. So um, we come back to this question about what makes psychotherapy work. But again, if you look at the evidence, the evidence is quite clear. Psychotherapy is, is long lasting. Okay. And, and since you mentioned the, 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 this, this idea that psychotherapy is learning something significant, does it take years? Does psychotherapy take years of, of weekly sessions or whatever to make a difference in the clients? Well, you know, it depends on a lot of different factors, but um, relatively short psychotherapy for many disorders and for many patients is quite effective. Uh, in the United States, in settings where a patient can get as much treatment as they want, they usually attend seven, eight sessions and have a remarkable effect. Now, there are some patients who chronic disorders or severe mental illness um, may need um, uh, continued care over an extended period of time. But this is no different than medical patients who get uh, for chronic disorders treatment throughout their life. A diabetic uh, um, or chronic heart disease these are patients whose condition is chronic and they need care throughout the life course. That's true for some patients in psychotherapy. But for many, mm -hmm. short-term focused psychotherapy is effective. I see. So we know that it works. We know that its effects are, are lasting and, and safe. Do we, I know this is a, this is a huge uh, one, but do we understand more or less how does it work and what makes it work? Well, this is where we have debates within the field about how it works. Um, you know, there are those that say it's the specific ingredients in particular treatments. Depression is caused by faulty cognitions. So cognitive behavior therapy is going to correct some uh, air in thinking that will alleviate depression. But by and large, investigations on the mechanisms of change uh, indicate that the specific ingredients of particular treatments don't seem to be responsible for the benefits. What seems to be important is that there's a social influence. The therapist influences the patient or persuades, we might even use the word persuasion, persuades the patient to do something that's healthy, to learn something about how to manage their problems. Um, some uh, coping strategies or some change in um, uh, one's outlook, lots of different ways to say it. But that seems to be common across a variety of therapies. And so the cognitive therapist may help um, the patient think about the world in a more adaptive way. The interpersonal therapist might assist the patient to have healthier relationships. The psychodynamic therapist may help the patient uh, uh, experience and tolerate different emotional states. Those are all important things in, in life. So we work in different ways, but the outcome seems to be just about the same. I see. I see. You've you've already answered partially what I what I would ask now, but I think it's important to ask it anyway, especially for for uh, people who are outside the profession and might uh, doubt about it. There, there's there's still a view among certain public opinion, and I'm sure it's it's quite worldwide. And even some health practitioners, I'm afraid, that psychotherapy is useful as long as one does not suffer from something real, so to say, from something with a biological base and serious, in which case only psychiatry and, and only medication will help. What does psychotherapy research how to say about this? Well, again, for most disorders, um, uh, uh, it looks like psychotherapy is just as effective as medication, even relatively severe disorders. 
for let, let's talk about uh, psychotic spectrum disorders. Mm -hmm. There's one where you could make a case um, that medication is important, but the evidence there is very clear that if it's simply medication, it's not going to be near as effective. If there's a psychosocial intervention, pe severe people suffering from severe mental illness need to be integrated into society um, to have good family and intimate relationships. All the things that psychotherapy is particularly adept at creating are mm -hmm. important even for severely mentally ill. Mm -hmm. You know, people with, with severe disorders um, uh, often are stigmatized, are uh, isolated from family, from society, uh, are, are not employed. These are all social problems that exacerbate, if not cause the distress. So psychotherapy, even for the most severe disorders, is a very important mm -hmm. uh, treatment. Mm -hmm. Sure, and, and, and going from mental illness to, to or Melton health to, to general health, there have been recent movements in Spain, as I'm sure in other countries already, or, or there will be, towards the increasing and progressive incorporation of health psychologists into general and primary health services, not only to traditionally mental health, health services and beyond the traditional mental health ones. This is surely related to the effects of the pandemics and, and a heightened awareness of the need to care for emotional well-being in general in a broader sense than mental illness or, or lack of mental health. Do you think that what we know from psychotherapy research uh, backs up this extension of psychotherapy models, techniques and skills to this broader field of emotional well-being and, and not only to, to mental illness, so to say, in primary care? Are we, are we prepared to, to be of service to a huge and larger amount of clients? Well, we know emotional um, health and physical health are related. These are not just two completely separate domains. So if, if you're suffering from emotional distress, some kind of mental distress or mental disorder, then it affects your physical health as well mm -hmm. and vice versa. So the integration of, of their psychotherapeutic uh, services in general practice is a good idea. There's a, there, it, it's just a, a historical accident that they're separated. I mean, you can go back and trace where this comes from, but we should attend um, to the whole person, their physical health and their emotional health. And it doesn't make sense that they're, they're separate. Now, having said that, um, we got to be careful about how the integration is accomplished. This isn't just like when the physician feels like, well, there's some emotional cause to the person's uh, physical symptoms. We'll just send them to a, to a therapist. It's all in their head. It has to be um, uh, uh, a thoughtful integration if it's going to be effective with the team working together um, mm -hmm. for the benefit of the patient. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Now, again, related to the inevitable uh, topic of the pandemics and, and COVID-19 and, and the scientific community reaction to it in this case, we, we have witnessed what uh, at least to me seems an impressively fast development of research and technology, in this case, maybe more medical one, directed to, uh, among other things, having vaccines available as soon as possible and medication. This is probably the first time in history that we as, as a species have been able to react that immediately and with such celerity to a health threat. And that reminded me of a lot, lots of things that you say in your book. In fact, you mentioned in your book many instances in history where the way that diseases were treated was more deadly than the disease itself in history. Yeah. What do you think that psychotherapy research could uh, and maybe should learn from such an impressive medical and technological fit as the one that we have seen in the case of the treatment of COVID-19? Yeah, well, 
clearly we want to make progress, right? And, and medicine has made progress, not always linear. There's sometimes when, when some of medical practices turn out to be harmful when we thought they were uh, beneficial. But on the whole, medicine is progressing. The, the, the longevity of humans um, is about double what it was 100 or 150 years ago. Psychotherapy, I have to say, you know, we're not progressing at that same rate. Um, the, we have made progress, and, and I can point to, to several different areas where we've made progress. But generally speaking, um, the effects of psychotherapy haven't grown dramatically. Now, having said that, um, uh, there are things we can do to improve the quality of service and benefit to a greater extent patients. But if we're going to look for some kind of breakthrough, like a COVID vaccine, mm -hmm. it's going to be remarkably effective and that's going to change dramatically psychotherapy. That isn't going to happen. Okay. So, you know, the actual uh, uh, area where we ought to put our resources is access. The mm -hmm. biggest problem we have is not uh, which treatment or can we improve the effectiveness of treatment, but it's can we get access for more patients to psychotherapy? Now, again, I know most about the United States, but getting a therapist and getting treatment, the needed treatment, is very difficult. Who pays for it? Who, who can afford it? Um, mm -hmm. Even if you can afford it, are therapists available who are competent to deliver the treatment? So there's issues I think we need to attend to around access before we hope that there's some remarkable breakthrough in the effects of the individual treatment. Absolutely, and this, this leads also to a, to a uh, financial question, obviously, and related to the previous one. To what extent do you think there's a the scarcity of financial resources and, and technological means, especially when compared to medical pharmacological research that has traditionally characterized psychotherapy research is a serious problem? for it, its advancement, or even for its delivery, as you were saying? Do we, do we lack money to do what we should be doing? Well, it's tremendously frustrating to see the resources put into physical health and the relative uh, uh, paucity of, of funds for mental health. Why is it that we think that mental health is, is as... Uh, um, is less of important to the patient than physical health. I mean, for many medical conditions, the distress uh, of having the disorder is more threatening than the disorder itself. So again, you're talking about integration of physical and mental health would help address this issue. Let's make uh, um, mental health services more readily available. And there are studies that, that indicate this is cost-effective. Mm -hmm. A patient who's emotionally distressed is going to use more physical health services. Great deal of research to show that. So it's probably cost-effective um, to treat uh, emotional distress and have the resources to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, going, going more into the specifics of, of psychotherapy research and psychotherapy practice and, and by, one, by what one sees in the journals and in the publications and when it's uh, updated and, and it's something that comes up often with the students of, and future psychotherapists, it looks like a significant amount of psychotherapy research seems to be increasingly concerned with also increasingly super specific issues and methodological details. And this, this is surely a sign of its own maturity. And, and I guess it's the case with many sciences. But to what extent do you think that the practicing clinician is somehow lost in this process of increasing specialized research published in very selective journals? Is research still relevant for practice? And what should be done if this were not the case? 
Well, it's an interesting question and a complex one. There is a lot of psychotherapy research that has little practical value for improving the quality of care. I find it frustrating to read some of the journals and realize how really divorced the research is from uh, the practice and even the science of uh, psychotherapy. On the other hand, I can point to particular advances we've made in psychotherapy research that I think have very practical and important implications for psychotherapy. And just to mention what I think is the most important one is mm -hmm. uh, psychotherapy research has shown um, quite clearly now that what's important for the outcome of psychotherapy is the therapist. Mm -hmm. Some therapists consistently achieve better outcomes than other therapists. In the last 10 years, 10 or 15 years, we've been able to identify what are the characteristics and actions of effective therapists. Well, this has implications for who we select um, to become therapists, the way we train therapists, and the way therapists in practice can, can get better. So I think there is um, really hopeful areas of psychotherapy research um, mm -hmm. kind of mixed amongst yeah. uh, some research that that is not so important scientifically and is not really applicable to clinical practice that's fascinating and that that's that was suggesting me the the need or may, maybe there are some some uh, means uh, already of, of finding this kind of translational research of, of uh, seriously, seriously uh, grounded uh, results that can be literally translated into the language of the of the practitioner. Do you do you think there are some uh, advisable uh, places to find this kind of translational research? Would you can you recommend any place where to find it? Because these results otherwise are lost. Yeah, the the translation. Um from science to practice is always uh, complex, even in yeah. physical yeah. medicine. Yeah. Uh, you know, they talk about that it takes uh, over a decade for scientific results to have an implication in clinical practice. In psychotherapy, I don't think it's gonna be easily translatable. Like, um, okay, do X instead of Y, in your practice and you'll have better outcomes. It's not gonna happen in that way. Psychotherapy is extremely complex. So there isn't going to be, again, mm -hmm. there's a difference between psychotherapy and physical medicine, but there, the results um, can have implications. Again, we come back to this therapist effects, which I think should have implications for how we train therapists and how we improve existing services, but it's not a simple translation where we just tell the therapist, you know, change uh, this aspect of your practice or even give them a one day workshop on how to do it differently. It's not that simple. Exactly. And this goes straight to the core of my next question, which was very practical. Imagine I was a, a clinician, uh, maybe a student of, of us, not particularly knowledgeable about psychotherapy research. What, what do you think would change in my practice as a result of meaningfully learning from your book, from the, the Great Psychotherapy Debate? What difference but, could it make? Yeah, I think it's becoming clear that um, if therapists wish to improve their outcomes, then they have to devote time and effort to improving outside of actually seeing patients. Mm -hmm. And it, it looks like, and this is one of the areas I'm particularly interested in, the therapists have to deliberately, deliberately practice certain skills to improve. It's a skill-based um, endeavor, okay? And you have to practice those skills. Mm -hmm. to, get better. We know this from the area of expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, musicians, uh, performing musicians, athletes, 
um, uh, surgeons, for instance, all of these skills take deliberate practice to get better. So it's like uh, practice makes perfect, but, but not only clinical practice in this case, the training practice as well. Yeah, well, I, I go back to my band instructor when I was uh, uh, a school student. Yeah. Uh, he was a fiery uh, guy. He mm -hmm. used to yell at us, practice does not make perfect. Mm -hmm. Good practice makes better. And actually, if you read the expertise, the literature on expertise, that's exactly right. He had it mm -hmm. right. It's not just spend a few hours practicing. You have to focus on particular skills and it's gradual improvement. This is the way, um, uh, like Rafa Nadal, you know, mm -hmm. best tennis player in the world. He's mm -hmm. always saying, um, uh, I have to practice with the same intensity that I play. And that's the key to getting, getting mm -hmm. better. Yes, in fact, you, you, you made me think that in, in in musical performance, but bad practice can even lead to to your hurting yourself and to and to you becoming uh, injured. I didn't understand Lewis. Yeah, that you can you can uh, that a good practice probably makes you a better musician, for instance. But bad practice can harm you That's in, right. in yeah. a very physical way. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Also. <laughs> Sorry, related to the previous question about increased specificity of research, do you, do you still see some room for theoretical developments in psychotherapy? Because I, th I think, in fact, you, you, your book presents a, a, a quite rich theoretical model as well as many, many facts and data. Do you think, do you think theoretical development is necessary? Or, or as has been said, we need less theories and more facts? <laughs> well, Luisa, if you're talking about uh, theoretical development as in developing new psychotherapy approaches, so we mm -hmm. have a new theory, mm -hmm. I would say absolutely not. Mm -hmm. We have over five or 600 different types of therapy, uh, none showing demonstrable superiority to any mm -hmm. other. So in terms of theorizing about approaches, mm -hmm. please, no more. But I think the theory about how psychotherapy works, uh, you know, theory is always informed by facts. It's not just something that's, that's pulled out of the air. Um, I think it's, it's, it, mm -hmm. it's very important. And, you know, this is what, over the course of my career, I've tried to do is develop a trans-theoretical theory mm -hmm. about how psychotherapy works. And that's mm -hmm. necessary to really understand um, uh, how it works so that we can make improvements. Without mm -hmm. a, a good theory, all the facts really won't help us. They have mm -hmm. to be tied together in some way that leads to improvement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and in fact, this, maybe this almost naturally leads to some question about psychotherapy integration as well as you know, psychotherapy research. Well, do you think, in the light of recent calls to, to, to agree on, on important things, do you think we will be able, as a, as a profession and scientific community, will we ever be able to agree on a series of facts that have been proved by research? And maybe more significantly, will, will the dissemination of these facts make a difference in the social construction of psychotherapy? Will we be perceived as more coherent and not exactly as as to psychologists having three opinions? <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting question. Um, I guess I feel some discouragement about the psychotherapy field. We have debates about some issues that I think are settled, okay? To me, there's absolutely no convincing evidence that one treatment is superior to another. Yet we keep on arguing about that. We keep on uh, spending huge sums of money to look for differences in treatment. You know, I've calculated we've spent almost a billion dollars comparing two different treatments mm -hmm. uh, when there's little evidence or none. 
than any treatment superior. So why are we persist in doing this? It, it, it's, so that part discourages me. Um, sometimes we discuss, well, are these our common ground? Um, and on an individual basis, I can have discussions with colleagues who think about the psychotherapy world very differently than I do. And we can come to some be, begrudging maybe agreement about, oh yeah, the common factors are important, and the specific treatment's important, the integration of those two. But in the community, it becomes uh, a partisan debate. And I find that unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And that made me think uh, another, another question that even if you, if you were clearly calling for, please do not develop more more theories, uh, psychotherapy, maybe even more, more practices. And despite, despite what we already know and the advances in research uh, that your book presents, in fact, so, so convincingly and so masterfully, we still witness in fact, the emergence of new psychotherapy practices and models without being previously investigated at all or, or validated in any way. Some of them maybe look more like social facts than serious proposals, and many of them uh, are quite uh, probably promoted and disseminated through social networks and influencers and so on, instead of properly accredited practitioners or scholars. Do you think that there should be limits to that in the same sense that one, not, one cannot propose and practice an untested and, and potentially unsafe medical procedure, for instance? Should, should psychotherapies be tested first? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, most of the treatments, um, uh, well, let me, let me say this carefully. Many of the treatments that are delivered by therapists have never been mm -hmm. tested particularly. Mm -hmm. um, does that mean they aren't effective? Um, probably not. They're probably just as effective as, as uh, um, the ones that have been tested. You know, cognitive behavioral therapy has been tested to a much greater extent than any other kind of treatment. Yet when it's compared to other treatments, even some of those that maybe are a little bit on the margins of what's acceptable, uh, doesn't seem to show superiority. Mm -hmm. So again, I don't know why we keep developing new models. Uh, um, and spending precious resources in doing that. I am going to say this also, though. There are some practices of therapists that I think are too far out of the mainstream and shouldn't be practiced. We have ones with legitimate psychological bases and ones that have reasonable evidence to support them. Why not choose from those and not spend time learning the latest fad, even if that fad is, is kind of mm -hmm. based on, on uh, nebulous scientific theory. Mm -hmm. We have enough treatments. Just get better at giving those than um, uh, uh, developing new ones. One other thing I want to say, and, and that is, you know, what really should be assessed is not the um, efficacy of particular treatments, but the effectiveness of those treatments as given by a particular therapist. So we want to ensure that therapists practicing whatever treatment, doesn't matter what it is, produce relatively um, uh, good benefits. So this leads to this idea of measuring outcomes in practice. And for this and for other reasons, I think that's, that's mm -hmm. really important that we do. We should be able to tell the public, not only is this treatment effective, but this therapist is effective. Of course, and that, that comes very clear in your work and in your book as well. And, and, and that leads almost spontaneously as well to my next question, which is, what do you think is the role of, of psychotherapy research in the training of new psychotherapists? Because at least some of them seem to consider practice and research as opposites to one another. And in some countries, this is in fact reified 
by the more research-oriented ones doing a doctorate and the more practice-oriented ones doing a master. Is the science practitioner model still one, one to aspire to, or are we creating two different communities? Well, I don't think there should be two communities. Um, it's not particularly good for either one. Um, scientists who don't know too much about clinical practice produce clinically irrelevant research. Um, the other way around is a little more complicated because I think you can be a competent therapist and, and uh, uh, benefit your patients without knowing too much about the research. So, but on the other hand, I think the training in research focuses on what's important in practice. For instance, this knowledge about therapists is very important for clinicians to understand because this uh, indicates to them that they're the locus of, of uh, the benefits and that they have to work hard in order to improve their skill to achieve better outcomes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't know anything about research, you may just say, hey, look, I know I'm doing a great job as a therapist. I don't need some researcher to tell me. Um, but that's not necessarily true. There, you know, I've looked at, at uh, uh, data sets with tens of thousands of patients. There are some therapists who, even though they might tell you they're quite provisioned, um, achieve outcomes that are clearly um, below what they should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, and that's where that's where research becomes also quality control, isn't it? Yes. I mean, there, there, there is a, an effort, and I think it's a very admirable effort to integrate in practice networks, research and practice, so that the research is being conducted in actual mm -hmm. clinical practice, mm -hmm. and it's being conducted by clinicians and researchers mm -hmm. in a way that makes it applicable. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great point. And, and I think if we do more of the research practice mm -hmm. network, research will have sure. um, more important results. And that made me also think, Bruce, to what extent supervision is the place where, where uh, this outcome-oriented results can be really uh, useful for the practicing clinician in terms of, of uh, as you say, some of them getting less than optimal results and not knowing it. Yeah. Maybe the call would be in these cases to be supervised yeah. and to and, and let research help you instead of only telling you that you are below uh, the expected results. Luis, I've, I've said what some people would consider controversial answers to some mm -hmm. of your questions. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give one here. Mm -hmm. Supervision as practice ordinarily mm -hmm. is, um, how, how do I want to say this? probably not productive, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Most supervision doesn't focus on the skills that are necessary to be a better therapist. It's important, maybe offers uh, emotional and social support, can provide some insights into client functioning. But as practice, there's very mm -hmm. little evidence that supervision is going to alert the therapist about what skills they need to learn to be better uh, therapists. You know, I'm working on, on with some agencies about changing the way supervision is done. So it's more skill focused than it is focused on the patient. Sure, it's fascinating in fact, because it's, it's, it's quite surprising, isn't it? It's, it's supposed to be the role of supervision and it's, it's not fulfilling it. Well, that's right. Supervision is the standard exactly. uh, throughout the field with very little research uh, uh -huh. supported. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in every clinical trial ever conducted, supervision is required. Mm -hmm. Yet these are the evidence-based treatment approaches employing something for which there's very little evidence. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a bit ironic. It's unbelievable. Okay, another question, Bruce. In the in the last decade or two, we have been witnessing an increasing 
increase influence and, and consilience and some authors say of, of discipline, disciplines not traditionally connected to psychotherapy research, such as maybe more, more visibly neurobiology or even machine learning and big data and artificial intelligence. Do you see them as auxiliary to psychotherapy research or do you think they incorporate their own way of, of making sense of human change that will end up at least potentially changing our vision of psychotherapy? Well, I, I think the, the large data and machine learning have the potential to marginally improve the field. Again, I don't think it's gonna result in any dramatic breakthrough. Um, it, is it a fad? Um, because that's what, what's happening everywhere in the world, uh, in medicine, but in engineering and in, in all mm -hmm. kinds of things. Um, you no, know, psychotherapy is such a personal endeavor, but it's a human interaction and human interactions hasn't really changed. I mean, we do it electronically now, mm -hmm. we text and all this kind of stuff, but fundamental human relations haven't changed in centuries. And because psychotherapy is really a social healing process through human connection, we're not going to dramatically find from machine learning or big data sets, anything that's a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And in fact, this was part of my next question, which was what, what, what role, what role do, you, do you foresee for your contextual model in, a, in an increasingly technified world and with, with this also neurobiology fads, do you see, uh, you think that humanistic inspired models still have a, a potential voice in, in, this, in this likely future? We know the, the, the neurobiologist who studies social relationship and produced a great deal of evidence that I think support my contextual model. Mm -hmm. So, it's certainly, if the contextual model is in conflict with neurobiological uh, results, then I've got to rethink mm -hmm. the model. Um, it, it, the model is supposed to be uh, a model that reflects how humans interact. And if, if uh, uh, neuroscience uh, gives us some way to look at this that that contradicts the way I've been thinking about it, I'll be the first one to, to mm -hmm. change it. But again, um, uh, I expect that as we look at the large data, as we look at the neuroscience, mm -hmm. it's just gonna become more apparent about how critical human interaction is in well-being, And I think that the results are, are pointing that way. You know, and it's not just psychotherapy, Louise. In mm -hmm. physical medicine, the relationship, even though it's undervalued in most medical systems, is absolutely critical to healing. And then we see it in teaching, we see it in, in business. The human element is absolutely critical to success. So what we do in psychotherapy in some ways is very different than anything else. But in other ways, it's very similar. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think you're very clear in your book regarding the role of the model. And you are very, very honest in, in, in your approach that if the model doesn't fit, the data doesn't fit the model, it's a model who needs to be changed. It's not a question of, of forcing reality to, to, right. Absolutely. to fit into the model. And I think it's, it's in every page of the book. And I was also wondering about your contextual model, to what extent do you see it, it, it is coherent with trends towards psychotherapy integration or with transdiagnostic approaches? Well, yeah, this is a complex question again. You know, it, it's interesting because in the history of psychotherapy, treatments were transdiagnostic. I mean, psychoanalysis, um, uh, Carl Rogers' humanistic treatments, these were all models that were applied across diagnoses. Then we got into this idea that 
there's particular psychological deficits underlying each particular disorder. And we had to have treatment specific or disorder specific treatments. And we went down that line of experimental mm -hmm. psychopathology leading to particular treatments. Now you see even David Barlow, for instance, developing a transdiagnostic treatment. So they're coming back mm -hmm. uh, to this idea that, that mental distress manifests itself in a lot of different mm -hmm. ways, but the underlying processes are mm -hmm. probably um, universal or at least 90% um, mm -hmm. universal. So I think the, the, the idea of transdiagnostic treatments is, is making comeback with, with and, it, and that's a good sign. Absolutely. Okay. It's, it's like going back to psychology, isn't it? It's like solving a problem that shouldn't be there to begin with. Yes. <laughs> that probably wasn't there to begin with, as you were saying, because the initial models were all, were all of them quite transdiagnostic in the, in the essence because they were psychological, not psychiatric. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. And finally, Bruce, what what advice would you give to a novel therapist from from your own, I would say, clearly privileged position, standing on the shoulders of giants, or rather of gigantic amounts of scientifically based psychotherapy knowledge? Your book is impressive in this respect. What what advice would you give to someone who is beginning now, and and maybe to a more experienced one as well? Yeah. What do we know that can alter their practice? Uh, a famous uh, psychologist, a psychotherapist and psychologist um, was asked, what does he think characterizes effective therapists? And his answer was a little bit surprising. He said, what characterizes effective therapist is curiosity. <laughs> and I think it's a very wise um, observation. Curious about the patient, curious about what led to the problems, what, what, what are the attempts to solve the problems, curious about why the patient is resistant to changing, curious of, just about the life of the patient. But then also to be curious about what makes psychotherapy work. Um, so that's the science. I want to not just be a good therapist. I want to understand why it works. And then be curious about whether I'm an effective therapist or not, okay? Don't just take it for granted that because my therapist thank me or, or they don't disagree with me or whatever I observe, be curious enough to say, I want hard evidence that I'm actually helping patients. So I'm gonna measure my outcomes and I'm gonna be curious about which type of patients I help, which patients I don't help, and make that attempt and effort to get better. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with that. And you made me think that, that at least in my, in my practice, I don't know if you would agree, curiosity is also very therapeutic for the patient himself and that, that maybe the, the patients that make the greater uh, improvement in therapy are the ones that are curious about their, their own suffering or distress instead of being, of seeing it as victims and that's, yeah, and I think that's what we instill in psychotherapy is this curiosity about mm -hmm. oh, why mm -hmm. why is it I'm distressed? Mm -hmm. What led to this distress? Mm -hmm. And curious, can I do something different that I've never done before? And the therapist helps instill that curiosity in oneself. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, Louise. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Bruce. I don't know if there's something that I, I left out and you wanted to, to address or to, or to answer. I think it, we, we made a, quite a, a panoramic view of the status of psychotherapy. We did. We covered the ground. And, mm -hmm. and I thank you for, for these insightful questions. You got to the heart of the matter. And uh, um, yeah, it's always... A pleasure for me to be able to discuss psychotherapy because it is the way we started. Your very first question is, this is a practice that works. 
and we need to know more about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Bruce, and you're more than welcome. And it's, it's also it's always a pleasure to, to talk to you. Good. Thank you very much.